Saint Clotilde's Queen of the Franks, Chapter Three. The conversion of Clovis and of his companions gave sincere joy throughout the Christian world. The Pope wrote to congratulate him on the great event. The share which Saint Remy had in it procured for him the title of the Apostle of the Franks, as Saint Martin a century earlier was called the Apostle of the Gallic nation. In fact, at that period, Clovis was the only Catholic sovereign in existence. The emperor was a Eutychian, the kings of the Vandals in Africa, of the Visigoths in Spain and Aquitaine, of the Ostrogoths in Italy, and of the people of Burgundy were all Arians. The conversion of the Franks happening about a century earlier than the arrival of St. Augustine among the Anglo-Saxons of England, the king of the French nation used to call himself the eldest son of the church. With the zeal of the neophyte, Clovis made strong and successful appeals to the body of the French nation to imitate his example and abandon their idols. Before long, he had the pleasure of witnessing the conversion of nearly the whole of his people. Those of them, who still remained unchanged, retired into Belgium, under a prince of the Franks, who resided near Cambrai, and indeed, part of the Belgian population remained pagan till the time of St. Bernard. Clovis also became an apt scholar of his holy wife, in works of Christian charity, in building and endowing churches, in relieving the poor, and in maintaining widows and orphans. When he had occasion to move his army in the neighborhood of churches or monasteries, he was more than ever strict in enforcing their immunity from plunder. It must be confessed, however, with the most impartial historians, that the love of dominion and of conquest was little changed in the Frank king by his conversion. Only when acts of injustice were successfully achieved, of which the pagan would have thought no more, the Christian king set about making reparations for them by munificent gifts to religion. He made the profession of Arianism, maintained by Alaric, an apology for attacking the kingdom of the Visigoths, in reality, however, burning with desire to plunder it for his own benefit. He defeated and killed Alaric in a pitched battle near Poitiers, and seized his treasury at Toulouse, and but for the threatening attitude of Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths, the royal treasury of Carcassonne would have shared the same fate. By way of compensation, Clovis made rich presents to the church of St. Hilary at Poitiers and of St. Martin at Tours, and, on his return home, he fulfilled a vow, which he had made before leaving it, to commence the erection of a church over the tomb of St. Genevieve at Paris, in honor of St. Peter and Paul, an edifice to which Clotildis put a finishing hand. About the same time, the Roman Emperor Anastasius paid the Frank king the high compliment of sending him the purple robe which distinguished a patrician or a high nobleman of the empire. He assumed the badge of his new dignity at the tomb of St. Martin, outside the gate of Tours, and thence rode in state to the cathedral, wearing a circlet of gold on his head, and scattering largesse to the people as he went along. The close of his reign was dishonored by the treacherous murder of several princes of his family in Austrasia, whom he desired to put out of the way, that the sovereignty might without fail descend to his own sons. His inordinate ambition satisfied, he had leisure to repent of what he had done, and to make such reparation as he could for his crimes. The last year of his life, a numerous council of bishops assembled at Orleans, consisting of five metropolitans, or archbishops, and twenty-seven suffragans. The king cooperated with them in securing the stability of the rising French church. He died the same year, 511, at Paris, and was interred in his new church, which afterwards became celebrated under the name of the Virgin Saint Genevieve. Three sons of Clovis and of Saint Clotilde survived their father, together with a fourth son of Clovis born before his marriage with Clotildis. They divided the kingdom among them, the towns of Metz, Soissons, Paris, and Orleans being their respective capitals. For some years they lived in peace. 
the queen dowager spent a great part of her time at tours devoted to good works and the daily worship of god in the church of st martin by and by however the french kings were again involved in war with their neighbors clodomir the eldest fell in an engagement with the king of burgundy leaving three young sons whose rights to their father's share of the kingdom obtained no respect from their uncles the unhappy children were educated by their grandmother clotildis who also removed to paris that she might more readily promote their interests and prevail on their uncles to do them justice the saint's surviving sons jealous of the interest that she took in the young princes and fearing that her influence might oblige restitution of their patrimony obtained possession of their persons by stratagem and put two of them to death the third clodoald or cloud escaping afterwards entered into holy orders and lived and died in a pious manner in the neighborhood of paris where in later times a church and a royal residence received his name of saint cloud in deference to the local estimation which he enjoyed as a saint the disconsolate queen recovered the bodies of her grandchildren and gave them a royal funeral in the new church of saint genevieve at paris our saint was destined to suffer another and still more cruel family affliction in the person of her only daughter clotildis who was married to amalaric king of the visigoths the young princess was a sincere catholic while her husband had the misfortune to be an arian this marriage of policy turned out a very miserable one amalaric insisted on his wife conforming to his religion she refused and had to submit in consequence to the most savage treatment from the king and even to the lowest indignities from her people as she went to public worship in her own church she at length appealed to her brother childebert king of paris and as a token sent him a handkerchief dyed with her blood the prince did not hesitate a moment he entered narbonne the visigoth capital with an armed force seized the treasury and killed Amalaric as he tried to escape. This act of summary justice accomplished, he sent out in triumph for Paris, taking his unhappy sister along with him, but she expired on the road, of the severe injuries she had received. Thus on the whole, the life of our saint, in that lawless time, had been a painful one. The massacre of her own family when she was a child, the death of her husband, the murder of her grandsons, and now the premature death of her only daughter had nearly filled her cup of bitterness to the brim but from this point the closing years of her pilgrimage on earth were passed in comparative repose she spent much of her time at tours in penitential observances and in continual prayer such property as she possessed was divided among the poor and the followers of voluntary poverty in the religious orders she built several houses for these, in various parts of France, more particularly at Reims, at Tours, and at Rouen. Old age found her engaged in these works of charity and of piety. During one of her visits to Tours, she received an intimation from a heavenly messenger that the day of her summons hence was very near. In the exuberant joy of her heart she cried out, Unto thee, O Lord, I have lifted up my soul. Come and deliver me. O Lord, I have trusted in thee. An attack of illness confided her to bed, but alms and prayer continued to be her constant employment. She sent for her two sons from Paris and from Soissons to come and see her die. They came at her bidding, and she foretold to them many events which were about to happen. On the thirtieth day after the summons of the angel, she was anointed, and then received the sacred viaticum, according to the usual order at that time and for many ages subsequently then declaring her belief in the most holy trinity she passed away from the scene of her many trials to everlasting rest the third of june five hundred forty five her departure took place in the night yet we are told that her chamber shone as if it had been noonday and that the brightness lasted till daybreak her sons conveyed the body of the queen to Paris, and laid it beside her husband in the church of St. Genevieve. 
from which they were afterwards removed to the royal mausoleum at St. Denis. <laughs> 